so my name is Brittany Paulzella, and I have been working in the film industry trying to simply follow what I believe is the calling for my life for the past maybe four and a half, five years now, because all of my life I knew that I was a performer and I knew that I had a gift to speak in front of people and to just bring joy to people in terms of performance. And so as a young kid, I genuinely thought that I was called to be like the next Hannah Montana or the next big rock star that was going to rock the world. And I genuinely thought that that was my calling. And when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to work with an organization called AMTC, which now has been changed to Shine. And it's an organization that stood for Actors, Models, and Talent for Christ. And it was this big, huge group of industry professionals that had a Christian worldview that were teaching young performers, you know, how to survive in the industry. And growing up in a Christian home and being a performer myself, I thought this was my perfect opportunity and they were gonna lead me to be the next Hannah Montana. And so I joined in high school and did all of the acting courses and did things like improv exercises and took all the classes thinking that this was supposed to be for me. And in high school, I was a part of the, uh, we called it NPTV, it was North Penn Television. And I was an anchor on our news station and we broadcast every Tuesday morning to, you know, the county. And it was something that I thought this was what I was meant to do. Well, flash forward a couple of years and I get to go to, I get picked from the group of Philadelphia of student performers to go perform in the Orlando convention for the AMTC, where there was going to be this big showcase of industry professionals and talent agents and all of these people ready to sign you on if you were good enough and if it was the Lord's plan for your life. Well, I went thinking, you know, who I am because I got accepted to go and I actually wound up rooming with a nice friend of mine named Rebecca. And she was also from the Philadelphia group. She was telling me how in the fall she would start her journey doing fashion design and filmmaking at a school called Liberty University. And I had never heard of it before. I had, you know, it was not something that my family had ever talked about. And so when she invited me that next fall to come and check it out, I was like, okay, we'll do that, sure. But this was the summer before, and I thought I my life was about to be changed. And instead of walking away with an agent or anything like that, I left with nothing. I left AMTC completely heartbroken. And what it was, was, was the first step of God humbling me and making sure that, Brittany, you might have what it takes to make it big in terms of being a movie star, but that's not what your goal should be. Your goal should be to shine for me and no matter where you're put. So he started having me really, really humbled. And I was put in my place many times where I wouldn't get the lead role in a show or I wouldn't get a role on a film set that I thought I was destined to have. And so it was from that moment that I walked on to the Zachy Gordon Cinematic Arts Center campus at Liberty and walked into the filmmaking classrooms and was so in awe with the facilities and what the opportunities were going to be. And I was only in high school. And I was like, okay, God, I see now why you had me join AMTC. I learned <laughs> that this is where I need to be. And it was nothing where I thought I was going to end up. Because when, as soon as I started the, you know, the academy there at Liberty, and I was a college student by then, I genuinely thought, okay, I'm past the I'm going to rock the world and I'm going to be Hannah Montana. I'm, that little girl thinking is gone. And now I'm going to be the next greatest female director that's going to come out and it's going to make all these big, huge movies. And I genuinely thought that that was supposed to be me. And so, because I had natural leadership abilities, and I had an eye for continuity, and I knew how to act, therefore I knew how to, you know, direct actors. And <laughs> what was discovered was I knew nothing. I knew nothing. I did not know how to write a script properly. 
I did not know how to direct. I knew nothing except what I thought I knew, which wasn't much. And our opportunity my junior year was to, it was my first feature film set that I ever worked on. And it was for part of your degree, you had to have two roles on this feature film set during your junior year, which the school made. And our year, it was the movie Extraordinary, which starred um, Leland Klassen and Sherry Rigby and Karen Abercrombie. And it was a big deal for us at the time because what, they, what the professors did was they hired out industry professionals to teach the kids. And so the kids were the crew. And so I got the opportunity to be on the art department and in extras casting. But that's not what I wanted at all. In the slightest way, I really wanted to be the script supervisor because if I wasn't going to be the director, I was going to be right next to him, you know, helping him call the shots and paying attention to continuity. And I really thought that God was like, here you go, Britt. But that's not at all what he wanted from me. He, I didn't get picked and I was heartbroken and devastated. But my professor said, you know what, Brittany, we're going to put you as a set dresser on the art department because you have a creative eye. It's still working with, you know, continuity and details and why not? So I was like, okay, fine. And I reluctantly took the set dresser position on Extraordinary, which three weeks in, the script supervisor hadn't even yet had the chance to break down the script. And I had already done so with the production designer, where he walked through with me and taught me step by step individually how to do it you know, one-on-one, -on -one, and I was so blessed to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one coaching, which then led into, as a team, the other set dressers, which were just my classmates, we had to figure out problems and make props for the film, and these big set pieces that when we were filming, you know, in the subsequent months during our junior year, we were able to look at Video Village and be like, oh, I made that, I did that, you know, I researched how to get that from a prop house, and I rented it, you know, for the production and we did that and it was such a thrill for me to put all this hard work into finding something like a filing cabinet and putting the final the filing cabinet on set okay. <laughs> and it was just so cool to see the hard work that you put in and seeing the fruition of that hard work right there on screen that I knew that okay I want to do this and God just, I felt like this nod of approval, like, yes, you finally got it. And I felt as if that my calling then was just to be a servant wherever he put me and to, you know, just do my best wherever that may be. In front of the camera, behind the camera, on the art department, in extras casting, wherever that may be. And so I've been doing this steadily since 2014-ish. So I might have gotten my math wrong. But I've worked on at least 14 to 15 short films of various quality because we were kids when we were doing them. Now we know so much more. I have worked on two professional commercials from Cruise Out in LA that filmed over here on the East Coast. I've worked as a production designer and as just the set dresser. So I've learned a lot from them. They have really nice budgets, I find, commercial shoots. So that's really great. I have had the chance to work on Extraordinary, which was a feature. I was given an internship to art PA on the movie Indivisible. And that was shot in the summer of 2017. So that was a huge gift. I learned so much from that because that was my biggest budget feature. And I was just the art PA, but I got the chance to create some props and set dress that wound up in even just the trailer. And, you know, in the final feature where the director would, with the production designer's permission, call little, you know, set PA Brittany over and show me on Video Village, like, hey, you made that. Hey, I'm putting that there. You did such a good job. And I just knew in my heart that if it was meant to be, it would continue. And it took a full year after Indivisible and working on a few short films in between where I was connected with the counter column people which is how you're connected to me via Matthew Jordan, the producer of Counter Column. And that was a really cool story on how I got on that project. And they actually entrusted me with the production design role 
after, yes, I worked on two features, but I had only ever production designed, you know, com not commercials yet, but short films. And they were like, you know, you're actually one of the more experienced crew members on our shoot. And, and I just looked at them and was like, oh, well, if you're willing to trust me and learn with me as we do this, then I will totally accept the job. And now two years after that, with a few commercials and short films in between, I am, I've been asked to production design my second feature this summer called Imagine That. And so I'm very excited because my dream is, you know, by the time I'm 50, I get to production design, big movies like Jurassic World, or, you know, even be a key set PA on such films where I get to just be a part of the magic that is filmmaking. And so how I got started was just a journey of thinking my life was headed for one direction, and it wound up being something that I, better than what I could have asked for because the opportunities that being on the art department on all these different projects has brought to me and the people I've met and the family in certain sets, it's just, that's been the ultimate blessing of, we make really cool stuff when we make films, but the best part of it all is the relationship you have with the rest of the crew, with the cast and subsequently with your audience. And now I think you would like to dive into more questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on your, on your success thus far. You've gone through quite a personal Thank journey, you. it seems. And um... Very much so. And I'm still learning. And I realize that I am, I am nowhere near the skill level that I aim to be, even in my, you know, my beginning years. I'm, I like to say to my family friends that I'm, I'm so low on the totem pole, even now despite all that I just got the blessing to like name off all those projects, but everyone's got to start somewhere. And, you know, I always like to say Alan Rickman, who plays Severus Snape in Harry Potter, he, you know, had a normal life and then discovered he loved acting, but didn't even make it big, didn't even get his first call back for an audition until he was like 45, you know? And so, and we now know him, you know, as, this big actor with the famous voice and but he started off small no one knew who he was and it's just things like that that often just blow my mind and if it's meant to be it'll be that's very interesting you know a lot of people they they do have the um Everyone seems to have a different way of looking at this. Um, I interviewed an, an actress named Leanne Johnson uh, a while back, and um, she had a very unique way of looking at how the, what roles she took. And okay. you know, it's, 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 it's interesting to see so many different perspectives on like success and what it means to people. So, mm -hmm. all right. But you, you mentioned before about the relationship with, uh, with the rest of your crew members, and that actually segues, is a good segue into the next question, which is... Um, okay. So uh, you, you mentioned before that a lot of people don't even know what the production designer is. And those who That's do true. seem to have a, the idea that you basically, you, you have a lot of influence over a lot of different aspects of what you see in the end result. And a yes. lot of people would look at that from the outside in and say, well, is that just what the director does? So what would you say to that? Well, something I learned in film school that I have realized to be true on all of the projects I've been a part of is the director's main role should be the performance of the actors and how the audience then perceives the story because of the director's vision and how the actors are portraying it. Now, the director is in charge of, you know, the creative decisions for everything, for all of the departments. They ultimately decide whether or not, you know, the gaffer shines a light that makes a diagonal cut through the screen. They are the ones that will work with each department and decide, yes, I approve of this. Yes, I see this, okay. But the production designer is a couple steps under the director. They're not, you know, they're not the head. They work under the director, they work under the producers, and they work alongside the director of photography, who's in charge of the camera team. They work alongside the gaffer, the grip and electric people, and, they're the ones, the way, even if you just Google search, what does a production designer do? I think what comes up like on Wikipedia is they handle the general look of 
a film or a television show or something like that on screen, the general look. But there's many different departments, even under production design. You know, you have people who only handle props and a prop is anything that an actor would pick up during the scene, that's a prop. If it's not a prop, it means the actor never touched it and therefore it's just set dressing. So that's already two categories, props and set dressing. Then there's people who are the carpentry, carpentry people. So they're the ones that on really big budget film sets will actually build the sets. Then you've got foremans who work with them for all the contractual needs. Then you've got the drapery people that only worry about things like curtains and how they, you know, the texture of the fabric and how that relates to the rest of the film. And then of course, if you're working on you know, a superhero movie or something that is fantastical, you have a whole nother realm of, you know, creators that are doing the, uh, the on-screen editing and the CG and the creation of the creatures as well. So there's many different facets of our department and the production designer is the one that is over that. So my favorite thing to say about the production designer is they're technically in charge of the set dressing and props, hair, makeup, and wardrobe. That's their purview. But they, a good production designer, which I now, which I'm looking ahead now to a couple questions down on your list, Chris, a good production designer will be able to easily delegate. And so they will be able to say, okay, well, if my job is the general look of the film, I can't do that all on my own. I need to, for, I need to bring in people who are experts in their craft and have them work under me. You know, I might have to give the final okay before it goes to the director and then to the producer after that. But I have to be the one that says, okay, no, that color red does not work. Can the actress wear a different shade of red because that red clashes with the red and the curtains behind them on set. That's my role. And a production designer on smaller film sets or short films even, they are the ones that will see the grand picture. Like, oh, this is a great location. We can totally film, you know, a kitchen scene in this kitchen and we can, it'll work. It's great because locations did their job and they found a kitchen that matches the director's vision and the DP's vision and they can visualize where the camera moves are gonna be in this kitchen. The cabin tree is already up. There's already a sink and a counter. It's gonna look great. Well, the production designer's job is to make that kitchen look like it's lived in. Make it look like the actors in the story actually occupy that space. So one of my favorite videos that show the importance of production design um, stars Gal Gadot, she's Wonder Woman. I don't even know who made this or what the reasoning was, except it shows the importance of production design. And Gal is sitting in a very well-furnished living room, ready for an interview. And she is fully prepared to, you know, th for them to say action. And then suddenly the art department starts removing everything from the room, from the chair that she's sitting on, to the curtains and the curtain rod above the window, to the blinds, to every single piece of furniture, to the area rug, to everything, to the outlet cover on the wall. The art department removes it all and she's standing there in a completely whitewashed box. And, the, and it was all silent with music and the title just was The Importance of Production Design. So we handle everything from the kitchen scene with the melted butter spilling, you know, onto the butter dish, that's art department. Even if it's not seen on camera, that's art department. If there is a crucial mug, cob, you know, mug or cup of coffee that the actor is supposed to have, art department's job is to watch that mug, make sure that we have multiple versions of that mug just in case it were to break. And the production designer is the one that ultimately picks which mug looks best after the props master has been like, here you go, here's 10 mugs to pick from, what do you think works? And so the production designer really is in charge of many details that many audience members really would not think of. They're just thinking, 
this is a great movie. You know, we're, we're in this world. We're in, you know, 1920 suffragette world, or we're in, you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But the production designer is the one that, if they do their job correctly, you just fall in love with the story and you don't even see it. Us filmmakers and film nerds and people who love movie making are going to notice that's excellent production design. But, you know, it's, you want to have it be so invisible enough that it just looks like it belongs. That just looks like the actors live there and that's normal life. And that's, I love doing that. <laughs> so I, one of my favorite things is being able to create a, create a world out of nothing. And of course it helps if you have a budget. But one of my dreams is to work on something like a Harry Potter film or and Chronicles of Narnia, where they had to build the forest of Lucy's first entrance into Narnia and that snowy woodland forest. The production designer and his, their team had to make that. They dug a big hole in the ground and they planted trees and they brought in fake snow. And then they put little Georgie Henley, who played Lucy, had her blindfolded and stuck her in. And the director was able to have a genuine reaction from the kid because suddenly she was in a new world. When in reality, she was just on a film set. But you wouldn't know that when you watch the screen. You would genuinely think that Lucy is in a woodland, snowy forest, and she's just entered Narnia from the wardrobe for the first time. But because the production design team did their job, that's the magic that you get to experience as an audience member. And that's what I ultimately want to do, is create a world like that. So far, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but one day, I hope to. Wow, that's quite a dis description of what you, of what you do. Quite a powerful <laughs> one, in fact. I need to find I that love video, to by talk the way. About it, Chris. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's exactly why that's exactly why you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, you basically answered just answered question three, which is what is the appeal of being a production designer? So <laughs> that's true. Yes. Uh, um. So, so you you just you just said that you you would love to work on really really bigger things like uh, like Jurassic Park things where you really need to think carefully about about these massive scale things and mm -hmm. these just wonderful amazing worlds that people create. Um, so you have so right right now you just basically got into a transition zone uh, recently with Counter Columns. So you have worked on a lot of short films before. And mm -hmm. of course, working on a, a short film is a very different experience all around from a feature film. What, as a production designer, what has been like the main dis differences that you've noticed? Well, in a short film, normally, it's a script that has been broken down to key elements to make you feel something. So in terms of locations, there's less. In terms of big sets that are needed, there's less compared to a feature film. So on a short, you're able to break up your script days and have it be so well organized that you know exactly when and where to be, what's needed, what key props are needed, what key set dress is needed, and you've memorized the locations. When it comes to a feature, more often than not, there's more than you know one or two locations. There's a whole bunch to make you understand the story. And those locations become very important, whether or not they're interior or exterior. As the production designer, you have to look at it as, there's an audience member about to watch this that wants to watch this film, not only for entertainment, but to get something out of the story. And so you have to break down things on a feature that you never, you don't have to consider on a short necessarily. For example, um, I worked on a short film this past, this past fall, I think it was, where the entire film took place in one room. Hmm. And the cool thing about it was we had scenes with kid characters that on a certain transition would change to their adult versions. So the kid character set was just a little girl's family dining room, but with like kid food on the table. And it looked like it was set up for a little girl's tea party. But then when we would switch to the adult versions of these characters, everything became, you know, 
for an, an adult's dinner party. It was the same dining room, same set around them, but the props around them and the set dressing on the table completely changed. That's great. You know, that was it. It would just switch. That was the whole short film. Whereas a feature film, you're most likely going to have, you know, exterior shots. You're going to build character backstories. There are some features that take place in one room, but they're, they're rare. And so you really have to work with locations and you have to hope that people are doing their jobs and the producers are able to help the locations people to be able to find you great locations so that you can do your job correctly. And another big change with, between features and shorts is how much time is needed to find all the things you need. And you might have a good portion of your script take place in one bedroom or one kitchen, but there's more than one day in the movie filmed in the, those locations as well. So every time you enter the kitchen, there's got to be either different food in the fridge, different food on the counter. Every time, you know, the actor has to choose a bowl from the cabinet and pour cereal in it, there's a different cereal they might grab or there's different dishes clean on the dish rack. Whereas a short film, that still could happen if you have multiple days, but it's so much easier when it's a shorter time span you have to film anyway. Normally for short films, it's not as long as a shoot as a feature for good reason. And there's so much more organization that needs to happen. But I found that if you do your job to the very best of your ability and you go above and beyond trying to do your best, even if you realize that maybe you're doing too much work for your position, but you love your job and you just want the best result and you do that for a short, that good work ethic and that team spirit and that go-getter attitude is going to work for you tremendously on a feature where if you are blessed with a team that can work under you, you'll be able to delegate all those jobs that you just put 110% of by yourself. You can give that opportunity to someone else to have them, you know, learn and you can teach them what to do and sometimes they might even know more than you. I know on counter column I had a couple of set dressers on my team. Some were kids. Some were young, you know, some were kids. They were teenagers. They were family members of crew members that were coming to help out and they they had never been on a set before. They certainly didn't know what I was asking. And then I had some people who had production design features themselves who were working under me. And I was able to be like, okay, well, here's the workload that I would normally do for a short, where I would handle every single little detail and make sure that it is close to perfect as I can get it. But here on a feature, you have the ability to say, hey, I need help. And you have more people who are more skilled to sometimes even do the job better than you, and therefore the end product looks that much better. For example, on counter column, We had this one really crazy day in our barracks scenes where we had our army recruits in these barracks and there was going to be this emotional scene with the main character and the schedule changed so much on the day that the first AD came to me and said, Brittany, we're we're switching it up. And instead of filming scene 21, you know, first that you were all planned out and we know you have the props for and it's all set up, we're changing it due to time restrictions. So we're going to film like scene 12. And I just looked at him and went, okay, (laughs) well, scene 12 was supposed to be shot like three days from now. And I know a key prop that is needed for scene 12. We don't have. And he said, well, can you make it happen? How much time would you need to make it happen? And I looked at my team of set dressers and I said, what do we think? And they said, 45 minutes. I'm like, okay. So I'm going to give you what the prop was. We needed concert tickets. So the plan already was it was on one of our laptops back at the production office. And we were very, we were about two hours away from the production office during this set. So not all of us had brought our computers because of lack of power and lack of Wi-Fi because we were in the mill middle of a camp in you know in the wilderness and so we had the files where we had already our 
you know, someone who was well-versed in graphic design had already made these concert tickets and they were the correct size with barcodes and it looked great. And all we would need to do is print it out on cardstock and bring it to set. And we were so ready to do that. But when they switched the scenes around, suddenly we had 45 minutes to create concert tickets. And I'm going to give a shout out to Morgan Willer, who was my set dresser in this moment. And she said, um, give me materials you think will work and I'll do my best. And so I was able to move away from her and handle set dressing the rest of that scene 12 in the barracks and change a lot of things around. And, you know, Betsy Clemens, our wardrobe supervisor, took the actors and changed their costumes. And everybody was working, you know, really, really quickly to make sure that we were able to get this shot in. And I came back to Morgan and after handing her all of the supplies and I handed her, um, like manila file folders, construction paper, and a bunch of markers and was like, can you make magic happen? And this girl came to me with handwriting that looked like it belonged from a computer font, two identical, you know, concert tickets in the correct shape like we had envisioned. And she goes, okay, this is what I, this is what'll work. And I'm looking at it like, wow. This is, this is, this is amazing. But something the director noticed was, uh, what about like barcode? We need like something you can scan. Like it needs to look legit. And so I looked at work and it said, all right, so the director would like a barcode. Any ideas? And she's like, I can just create one with black lines. I don't, and we both just kind of looked around at our supply table of all of my arts and crafts bins and things like that that I brought to set in my set kit and we decided we're going to take old gas receipts that we had already turned in and been reimbursed and we'd cut out the barcodes on them tape you know nicely glued and taped it to the bottom of the the concert tickets presented that to our director and he genuinely thought these were the ones we printed and they're in the film whether or not they're seen in all their glory that they should be, we were able to do that. And it blew my mind because Morgan, in that moment, was way more experienced than I was. And she was able to take the stress that I was feeling of a sudden change in shooting schedule and was able to create something so much better than what we could have imagined in the moment, being that we didn't have the materials we needed. So what I've learned from that is Yay for delegation. Yay for trusting your crew to handle problems that arise on set. And also make sure that instead of waiting until the day that you need a prop, you know, to have it ready, try to have them all ready before that week begins. And now I know that's something that I definitely learned from Counter Column was instead of planning ahead of time, like, oh, we'll go buy that watch that we need, you know, the night before and then return it the day after we film it. No, 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 have that in the beginning, just in case, just in case the shooting schedule changes. And on short films, there's less of a chance of a shooting schedule change because it's shorter content, shorter shooting schedule, and therefore there's less area to play with. But on a feature, you've got to worry about locations, actor availability, and things change all the time. So the art department really needs to be on their game, ready to move, because it's unlike the grip and electric team with their grip truck and the, or their camera truck, that they have all of their equipment for the entire shoot in one location, that if something were to change, they just need to go back to their trailer and get it and bring it back to set. The art department, more often than not, unfortunately, depending on the budget, we don't get the truck that we so need on sets and we need a trailer or a truck or even if someone has a big SUV that can handle all of the all of the props and all of the set dress for the entire film and it would it would definitely be helpful i would say when you're transitioning from a short film to a feature to have more than one person on art department and that is something that I also experienced was I did a lot of my short films by myself 
as the production designer. And because it was such a small crew, I did art department, I was in charge of costumes, hair, makeup, and wardrobe, and I was the script supervisor often as well. So there was a lot of things to handle on a short film, but on a feature, hopefully you're only having to handle your one department. And hopefully there are people under you. And that's what will make the project that much better in the end is when there's all these creative minds and skill sets coming together that it works out a lot better. <laughs> did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. It okay. certainly did. That's quite a, an, an example of just quick thinking innovation, by the way. Props to that person. Uh, yes. I, that was very, my that was whole very team cool. Was, <laughs> my whole team on Counter Column was, like I said, they all came from very different backgrounds. And they were working with me, who some of them had never met before. And it was an amazing testament to just resilience in terms of filmmaking, because we filmed in places that wouldn't normally be used for a military film set. But we made it work. And there were volunteers, and there were people who put in their complete A-plus efforts to do a job that they never even tried, but they were willing to try. And so it was so, I mean, we had these obstacle courses that needed to be built with barbed wire and big logs and things like that, that the recruits would have to, you know, do resilience training on and, you know, army crawl through the barbed wire in the mud. And it was these big, quote, action montage sequences in the script. And I remember reading them and saying, okay, I don't know enough. I don't know enough about carpentry to build this. I can design it, but I don't, I personally don't know enough and I don't know if we have the budget to build it, nor is there enough time for me to go build it elsewhere while you film, you know, another scene. And we had volunteers come from the local community and the church that helped make Counter Column and just some just some grown men who knew what they were doing with tools built us our obstacle courses. Okay. And I got there on set and it looks like I did a great job. And I can't even, I can't honestly take the credit because yes, I had a hand in designing what it might look like in the final. And I was able to like, look at the sketch and be like, this is what I want. This will look bad. That will be a detriment to the actors. But I, that was just people who were a part of the film set who made it look even better than it did. And that's something that I don't take lightly at all. <laughs> that is awesome. Just, um, so now that you, now that you, we are talking about um, different, di like different people and delegating it to different people for, uh, mm -hmm. for their jobs. So a lot of people say that uh, short films are a fantastic way to, um, to prepare you for feature films. Um, yes. So, now the thing is, a lot of most, very very often, um, you do not really have th that many people on just one singular short film. So mm -hmm. now the way you were talking about it before, uh, I mean, they obviously it's less content, and I do not want to. I'm very hesitant to word it like this, but it it seems like a, a short films are because you can so much more easily plan it. It's almost like a cakewalk compared to um, to doing a feature film where so many more things can go wrong and uh, there are so many more people involved. So my question to you is, so how does, if you have, because oftentimes in short films, if you have one person handling so many different things, um, depending on how it's set up, you know, uh, which varies depending on who's the director and who's running it, um, mm -hmm. what is your advice for becoming good at production designing in terms of short films? It's an excellent question. Pre-pro is the key to making any production look really good. And as soon as you get the script and you are signed on to the project, you have to immediately read the script simply for story. You need to understand what the message is, and you need to get the general feel and the emotions you get from reading the script. And then you immediately need to have 
you know, conversations with the director and the DP to understand their vision for the story. And then it's up to you to break down the script and figure out what is needed. You know, are you going to have to build barracks, for instance? Or are you going to be able to just film on location and the only thing you need to do is supply the pillows for the bunk beds? And you need to figure out all the resources that you have and all the resources that you still yet need. And for short films, it's you really need to focus on the task at hand one thing at a time. So for me, the first thing that I would do is I'd take a pack of colored pencils and your script, and I would immediately start circling and underlining anything that is written in the stage direction, like a cat walks by the tree. So with one colored pencil, circle the cat, another colored pencil, circle the tree. Because hopefully you're not being asked to, you know, plant a tree. Hopefully locations have found you a tree that you have the permission to film near. So tree is already taken care of, but that counts as set dressing. That's a key location. And therefore that needs to be noticed in your production design planning. Cat, okay, is the cat real? Yes, where are we getting the cat? How, you know, do we need the cat to be sedated? What do we need the cat to do? Do we have the legal rights to use the cat? Whose cat is it? And the production designer has to be able to pick, okay, this is what we're gonna do, this is our situation, and then they can move on. And you flip to the next page, and you do the same thing. And you figure out what is written in the dialogue, what is written in the script, plain as day, in black and white, okay, we need this, this, and this. Your second pass through your short film script should simply be, okay, I know what's needed, what's written, but what would be good to add to make this more believable? For example, um, if we had a scene with a grandfather who liked to read all the time, and all that's written in the script is grandpa sits in his library and reads a book. So you're, you're hoping that in locations, there's gonna be a room that generally looks like a library, but you have to be prepared. Okay, I'm gonna need bookshelves. How many bookshelves am I gonna need? How big is the space? What kind of books am I going to require? What are the colors of the bindings of the books? And things like that. And how many do we need? What's the sizes? Is he sitting in an armchair? Is he sitting in a recliner on the sofa, on a wooden chair? And these are the things that you choose, you talk with the DP and the director about, and you write down all that's needed in your script. And you continue on your third pass of the script is, especially if you're the production designer and you're in charge of the general look of the film, you write down, okay, this actress, the vibe we're getting, the DP and the director is that she always wears yellow. Okay. So you have to make sure that none of your props, et cetera, that you've already marked and planned for, don't have yellow in them, so that she stands out. So now you have to talk to your wardrobe supervisor so that the costumes look okay in the space you're planning for. But then lo and behold, probably short film or feature or commercial, when you get on location, everything's gonna change anyway. But as, but as long as you have the pre-pro planning and all of your notes from all of your passes of the script and you know you're seeing so well enough, that when the first AD comes to you and says, hey, PD, we're changing the order of the day, you're able to be like, okay, so we no longer need the pocket watch or the stack of books. Instead, we need the cat and the water bottle. And you have everything written out and everything is very clear in your script and you have all of your notes, they're ready to go. So in terms of being organized on a short film set, I would totally say that you really need to focus your power on um, being as clear and concise. Don't overdo it. And um, find help. You know, find people who are willing to donate set pieces and key props to you so you don't have to overspend your budget. And really, really hope that 
and really try to get at least one helper. I find in production design, you really can do it all. You need to have at least one helper. Even if that helper is the producer on a short film and you have another classmate or another friend of yours that is able to come on to set that day and is able, that can mix your fake blood mixture for you while you set dress the wound. Because if you don't have a makeup artist, sometimes the production designer needs to do that too. So you really need to just be fully prepared to take on any challenges you need. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Constantly check with your DP. Does this look okay in frame? Is this in frame? Is this not okay? And then one of my favorite things, and this is a side note for both short films and features, is working with your gaffer. Oftentimes that's not something that's discussed, is that the art department and the lighting department have to talk. <laughs> and reason? They have, their job is to light the scene and make the actors look as good as possible and create the correct mood for the story. But they can't do their job if the set is completely boring, completely bland, or completely clashes with the action on camera. You, as the production designer or the art department, can't do your job if it looks really dark, really shadowy, if things are hidden because the, gaffing, the, you know, the gaffer team did not do their job. And I'm a production designer that loves certain things in her film sets. If she has the choice, she's going to put little symbolism pieces or little colors that matter to the story. For example, I worked on a short film last year in three different blocks called Hero. And this film had to do with redemption and forgiveness. And it was a very good story about a father and a daughter and their relationship and trials that they went through together. Well, a lot of our short film, there was a couple scenes that take place in this teenage girl's bedroom. And it goes from a teenage girl's bedroom when she's 13, and then later in the film, it's her bedroom again, but she's like 20 or 21. And so you have to see the transition in terms of decoration, production design from when she's 13 to when she's 21, okay? Well, I went and bought a lot of things for the bedroom that we wound up filming in. And cool little note, there's a movie on Netflix called The World We Make. And The World We Make was actually shot at the same house in Franklin, Tennessee that we shot our short film Hero in. And the main character's bedroom in that story um, is the one that we filmed our main character's bedroom in as well. But for their movie, it, a teenage boy lives there who has a very uh, rustic look, like he lives in the country, and so there's things like horses and horseshoes everywhere and like a video game system. For ours, we had a very girly girl who was 13 and, you know, loved pink. And so we had to transform that room. So I wound up buying a new bedspread, new lamps, new picture frames, new wall decorations to completely transform the space. And something that I bought was a lamp from Walmart that had an Edison bulb in a brass cage. And I personally love Edison bulbs because on camera they look awesome. And some of the best music videos with cinematography involve Edison bulbs, I have to say. So I love to use them if they fit within the story. Well, the Edison bulb, to me, it was just, that was the light that worked in that, you know, that lamp. So that's what I was prepared to do. And I put it on set and I turned it on and I was like, yes, it gives this nice amber glow. And I like the amber because it's different than the rest of the room. Your eyes are attracted to it. I like it. My whole thing was in an Edison bulb, you can see the filament glowing when it's turned on. But with the cage over on this lamp, to me, symbolism meant 
that the character, she still was shining, but she had such trouble with forgiveness, she was caged in. And so th I really wanted that on set. Now, most people watching here were just going to watch the bedroom, you know, and the girls in the bedroom scenes, you know, writing uh, in her diary, and they're going to be like, oh, that's a great set. Woo! Great story. Most people are not going to notice that there's a lamp behind her that's a little, little dim Edison bowl in a cage, symbolizing. So, symbolizing that she's, she's in this cage of unforgiveness, and she can't break free from it. Well, our gaffer on this project, his name is Grant, he, he's like, Brittany, I really love your set. That is the wrong color temperature. I'm going for cool tones. Your amber light does not work. And I'm like, what? No, no, no. I have symbolism. This is my thinking. We must have, we must have this lamp on in the scene. It can't just be off. That ruins the symbolism. And he's like, okay, all right, hold on a minute. So he goes and he talks with his team and he comes back and he plugs in a dimmer switch. So my really bright orangey amber glow suddenly went quite dim, which helped the symbolism even better. And the lamp was still lit in the scene, but your eyes are not automatically attracted to it because he did his job. And I did my job by putting it there in the first place, but we, we talked together and Grant and I make a really good team in this way because we were able to say, okay, we both know, A, this lamp needs to be there for the sake of production design, but B, the color temperature is wrong. How do we solve this problem? How do the departments talk to each other to make it look like it's the best set ever, pretty much? And so we worked it out. We did it. The director had no clue. He just came in and was like, wow, this is gorgeous. This fits with my vision. Let's go. And Grant and I stepped out, they filmed the scene, and so on. And for me, it's moments like that that happen on shorts, film, you know, features, commercials, any form of media, that if the di different departments are really working together really well, then it's, a, then it's a great movie. But if something looks wrong, if you've got a piece of set dressing that looks completely wrong, it's probably because someone didn't communicate with another department and therefore you know part of that quality is completely gypped and for me it's heartbreaking because I can be watching a film and be like okay I like the story I like what they're doing um hmm that flower pot had yellow daisies in it and suddenly it's yellow tulips Okay, well, our department switched it. They didn't talk with the script supervisor and the script supervisor did not catch the continuity and it wound up in the final cut. And so the departments need to talk to each other. And that is something that I highly stress and highly do. And something that is often forgotten is when you do location scouts or tech scouts, most of the time you take the people with techie jobs. You take the director, the producer, locations, camera, lighting, electric, and sound. Hopefully you take sound. Oh my word. Sometimes they get forgotten too. So, but then they go and do the tech scout. And the first time the production designer is on set is like the day of shooting. Or, no, no, no. They have to see the location first. And they have to be with them with the rest of the technical people because they need to see the space, they need to see how the furniture is going to look, and better yet, if they have eyes there to even check for things like costuming. If the location that comes pre-furnished pre and there's an olive green couch, the reductor designer can take a picture of it, be like, okay, I can move this couch over here, this will work in this space, and they can go home and talk to the wardrobe supervisor or the costumer, and be like, okay, so you know that really nice olive green dress that we had for the actress? Well, now we need to make it blue because of our location. But what happens a lot of time, especially on short film sets, is that in the pre-pro sta planning stages, the production designer is often left out of these tech scout meetings. So in the moment, they're expected to solve a major color clash problem 
or, oh, we need a lamp for this corner. Quickly find a lamp. And you're scouring the entire location to find a lamp that may or may not work in the space. Whether or not it's turned on, you have to talk to the gaffer, but they should be involved when it comes to location scouting and tech scouting. And more often than not, unless it's a huge big budget, like for Universal Studios that can build an entire dinosaur cage, they're going to want a location that already exists that they can just make look better and make it look like the actors belong there instead of creating something out of nothing. Unless that's part of the world that you're trying to create, then you have to. Okay, got it. <laughs> does, that, does that answer your question in terms of what's important and talking with other departments and things like that? Did I nail any of that? Absolutely. More than, more than that, actually. That was very insightful and put, it, put yeah. a lot of things that I, that I could have asked in, in perspective. We are okay. almost out of time and I do not want to take too much of yours, but I do. We have... can keep going, Chris. I just, I don't know. I'm okay. I'm free, but I know with your, with your audience and your time limit. So just let me know. Oh, no worries. I, I think you, you basically covered everything. The only thing that I have, um, uh, the only remaining question that I have for you is, um, okay. So you mentioned before that production design is very, very much in the shadow a lot of the time. Like the audience doesn't even notice it. So let's say you're comparing two movies. Um, they both feature a perhaps similar, this is hypothetical, perhaps similar alien world, all right, an alien planet, let's say. Oh, gosh. Um, okay. So let's say you, you watch both of them. Mm -hmm. um, one is mediocre in its production there's, design. There's the lamp. Oh, that's the lamp? I bought it from production <laughs> from Walmart, but I bought it from production because I loved it that much. Okay. Alien world. I'm so sorry. No worries. Um, so... The two, the two movies have two similar alien worlds, um, one of which the production design for it was mediocre and the other one was excellent. What would you okay. say is the difference? Would be the difference. Okay. The obvious thing without seeing the two films, budget. The mediocre film did not have a budget that they had the ability to spend to make it look really good, the better looking film did. But that's not always the case because sometimes you could have no budget whatsoever and make a really great looking project. And so it, yes, money counts. Money always counts. But another thing that would count is how much planning and how much creative thinking is put into Making something work. For example, if you need a spaceship and you need to build said spaceship and put two actors in the spaceship, okay, are you going to use what's around you and think about it in terms of can we use, you know, a car from the junkyard and can we add pieces to it to make it look like a spaceship? so that there's actual, you know, a whole window for the starscape is already there and made. And can we use the doors for wings? And can we use what we have for no money and make it work? Or do we try to create something really, really high tech with, you know, welded metal sheets and we put the actors in that big, you know, conglomeration and then we try to fix it with CG. It really depends on what you know you have the skills to do. And if you are, for example, if you're a film student and you're writing a short to be made for the sake of graduation, for instance, don't make some, don't write something that's out of your A, budget availability, and B, practical, pra just practicality. If you're not able to make the spaceship, don't have it take place in a spaceship. Have it take place in the middle of a field where they got dropped down by the aliens. And then, you know, like, but, and the props that they have, that's what you can spend all your time on. The laser ray guns, the costumes, and you can make that look really, really good. So focus your attention on what you do have and 
what would classify from good from bad simply is how much cohesiveness there was, again, with the other departments as well. Um, I'm trying to think of a bad movie that I just was like, oh, dear. I do know that some movies are, I mean, some people get awards for their production design, you know, and yes, I'm just wondering yes. like, well, like, you know, people say, oh, uh, that's, it's okay. You know, it works, you could say, versus that was amazing kind of thing. I was just wondering, like, it, it may be hard hmm. to see from like the audience perspective because you don't see what went on to make it happen. Right, so. right. Whew. I really don't have an example, except, okay, okay, so, um, something that not a lot of people know about me is I, Brittany, am a huge Marvel nerd, and my friends and family are going to laugh, they're going to be like, we know that, <laughs> so I, I love the Marvel MCU, I love the comics, I love the stories of a lot of the characters, Captain America is my favorite, see, mm -hmm. um, well, let's just take, you know, the Tom Holland Spider-Man, in his movies, in the MCU, the, so far, we've seen Peter Parker's bedroom three times. And <laughs> three times it's been completely different. And the reasons for that were simply change in locations, change in directors, change in sets. That why they changed the bedroom, I do not know for certain, except in Captain America Civil War, which was the introduction to this version of Spider-Man, his bedroom was like a cubicle size, completely bland walls, two doors, closet, and the entry door, and Tony Stark comes in and chats with him, and he has like a desk and a window. That's it, and a twin bed. Well, when you flash forward in the MCU to Spider-Man Homecoming, where Spider-Man comes in the window, and Ned is sitting on his bed with the Lego Death Star. Okay, you have to see this movie, because I realized all this because I'm you know, a nerd, but <laughs> he comes in, it's a completely different bedroom, completely different set, they live in a different part of Queens, and it's a completely different bedroom, but for me, looking at it, the second bedroom is so much better in terms of production design. The first bedroom, it felt as if they just quickly found a location, stuck it in, and put the actors in the set, and said, here you go, film, and it it didn't really show too much of who Peter Parker was at all. The, the cool thing about the scene in Civil War was that his handmade Spider-Man costume was hanging from, a, you know, the attic ceiling and Tony Stark pokes it and it falls out and quickly, you know, Peter Parker throws it away. That was the cool thing about that. But that was it. It was a completely bland room. Yes, they don't have a lot of money at May and Peter don't have a lot of money, but it was so-so. Well, Spider-Man Homecoming, it looked like a real teenage boy's bedroom, even if they don't have a lot of money. I mean, it had sports memorabilia in it from the New York Mets, and I totally noticed because I'm a New York Mets fan. It had, you know, school posters in it. It had books. It had Lego sets. It had a bunk bed. And it made it feel that much more real. And although mo both movies are really good, and I love them both, I was able to say, as someone who works in art department, wow, <laughs> I would, first I would be proud to work on Civil War, mind you, but for Spider-Man Homecoming, for that one scene in the bedroom, it made it that much better. It was that much better of a viewing experience because there were details that us nerds or just general audience members could watch and be like, wow, we genuinely believe Peter Parker lives there. Good job. Good job. So for me, neither of them are a bad movie or a good movie, but it's like, there's an example right there on how to turn something that, yeah, okay, we can film a scene. It's so-so. It's fine. It's believable. Peter Parker lives in the bedroom versus, wow, yeah, he totally lives there and Ned comes to hang out all the time and they build a Lego Death Star. There's a, there's a difference. <laughs> yes. So actually, I just recently rewatched Spider-Man Homecoming and I was watching the behind the scenes and I was like, oh my gosh, wow. Like the sets that they built, the Spider-Man has to climb the National Monument. He didn't actually climb the National Monument. You can't film at the National <laughs> Monument in DC. 
but they, you know, they built it to scale, not the full thing, but like, you know, the top corner of it. And they scaled it just a little so that he didn't have to be on wires the whole time and he could actually climb up it. Like things like that, that's actually under production design. Hmm. And that makes my heart happy because they, they had to go, they had to check out the original location. They had to work with their set building team, their construction crew, and they had to make it look like it was actually in a warehouse, you know, and they, Spider-Man had to climb it. And that's, that's production design. It's also production design when you watch Counter Column and the, fa- the Neil family is eating dinner from, it's production design when Spider-Man climbs up the National Monument. It's production design when the Neil family in a little movie that we love so dearly, it still has yet to be released, Counter Column. When that movie comes out and you see the family finishing up dinner and going through a stack of mail together, the dinner on the table had to be, had to make it look like, well, we had, the art department had to make it look like the family had finished eating. So when we, right before we hit act, we said action, I set the table with scraps of lettuce pieces from their salad, scraps of, you know, chicken, chicken on the bone from rotisserie chicken, whatever we had there, and dressed the plates in that, and I, few of the other departments got a kick out of it because I was like, I need this to actually look like a kid took a bite out of it. And I'd hand, you know, a drumstick to one of the grips and was like, eat it, take one bite, I need it back. And I put it on the plate. And so when you're watching the movie, you're just going to be like, oh, cool, they had dinner. Believable. Yep. But production design actually had to go through and choose how many green lettuce pieces were going to be left on the plate, what kind of dressing would be spread all over the plate, How much food would the little kid in the scene actually eat and how much was left on the plate? They had to make all that up. They had to decide all that. They had to plan for that. They had to get the supplies. That's the same. That's production design as well as building the National Monument. And it's details like that that make filmmaking for me so enjoyable because you can be, you know, building a dinosaur animatronic and making it come to life for movies like Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Or you can be doing this really deeply moving, powerful story like the King's Speech, where the main set is a walled papered room and a settee at settee and a couch or two in the therapist's office and the desk and the single lamp. And you can be doing your job and you can be making magic moments happen for your audience just because of the set or how detailed or how you know undetailed it needs to be but i just find that amazing i one of my favorite filmmaking stories is the behind the scenes of uh the harry potter movie with eddie redmayne So it's not Harry Potter, but what is it called? Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them? Mm -hmm. Um, The art department, it's not even seen on camera at all, which breaks my heart. But they, there's scenes in this office in the Ministry of Magic where there's all these desks where all these workers so supposedly work and there's magical paperwork all over the place and it looks like a complete unorganized wreck. They went to the excruciating detail planning of they did like charts and like all of these notes and paperwork and put them in the desk. So it made it real enough that if the actor just happened to sit down and be given direction from the director in the moment, okay, look through your desk, find something you could work on. They're not just opening up the desk and finding empty drawers. They open it up and they're like, oh, hey. This is, this matches here. Oh, okay. And I can start working here. And they're not taken out of character because there's nothing and they have to act like the drawer is full. The drawer is full with details that match the magical world we're in. You know, no one's going to know that unless they make a behind the scenes package and people like me could watch it. And so I, I thoroughly enjoy filmmaking secrets like that because even on a really smaller scale you can have moments like that all the time 
For instance, I did a black and white short film called Reflection in January of 2018 when it was a 1930s period film. And we had two 1930s period cars in the film as well. But a little secret from that movie was we needed a picnic scene and we filmed in the front of this really nice Florida mansion. And it, it looked gorgeous for the film. We had multiple couples and families and children playing or sitting out in the front lawn. And we had baskets of food and fruit and champagne glasses. And it genuinely looked like a picnic scene from that time at a rich, you know, rich person's property. But what you would never know is that the location we were filming at was simply a facade. The house that we were filming in front of looked like it was this big rich mansion, but inside was completely unfinished, was full of scaffolding. There was, it was all wood. There was no real rooms in it. And, but you would only know that if you were there on set and if you happen to know the behind the scenes of it, but it looks so good. The set looks so good. Production design looks great. But a secret behind it is that that's just an empty house that's not even completely built yet. But no one would know that because each department did their job to make it look like it functioned and was a real home. And so, oh, Chris, I love talking about these secrets for filmmaking. So <laughs> thank you so much for talking <laughs> about you. this. You know, this has been very insightful. And uh, you said you value communication among people that clearly... Oh, yes. um, that clearly shows with the way that you explain things. You are clear, you put things in perspective very well. Thank you so much thank for you. being here, Brittany. This has been very yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.